there are less than 400 mountain gorillas left in the world. The mountain gorilla may become extinct within the same century as it was discovered. The future of the mountain gorilla is contingent upon the whims of man. These animals are among our closest relatives. Their relationships are, in their way, as intricate as ours, and their family groups have strict hierarchies. Their size, strength, intimidating chest beats and screams led to the King Kong image. This is unkind and undeserved, for gorillas are shy and gentle and have no real enemies other than humans. Their bright eyes suggest great intelligence, and for the infants, play forms the main part of the daily routine. This is not the lowland gorilla, which lives in the rainforests of West and Central Africa and number in the thousands. This is the rare mountain gorilla, larger, with thicker fur, and only discovered at the turn of the century. There may never have been thousands of these gorillas. Their range is too limited. But at the last count, there were fewer than 400 left, perhaps half as many as there were a decade ago, and now showing all the typical danger signs of a dwindling population. Unlike chimpanzees, the other African ape, gorillas are almost completely vegetarian. They appear to lead a life of leisure in a luxuriant paradise, a salad bowl where they need only to stretch out an arm to eat something succulent to eat. It's not only the infants at play. Adult males indulge in play fights an important social activity that may help to establish an individual standing in the group. The silverback male the leader of this group finally gets the better of the younger blackback male and reinforces his dominant status. Encounters with other animals are infrequent. A chameleon, one of only two reptiles found here, elicits rather more than just passing curiosity. Mountain gorillas inhabit the Virungas, a chain of six inactive volcanoes in the heart of equatorial Africa, at the point where Rwanda, Zaire and Uganda meet. Their conservation area is tiny, some 25 miles long by perhaps eight miles wide, with another smaller area in Uganda, separate from the rest. The gorillas range through beautiful montane forest, bamboo and alpine meadows up to 13,000 feet Areas that provide a huge variety of food plants. The highest volcano is Mount Karasimbi at 14,800 feet.
Serious study of mountain gorillas didn't begin until 1960, when George Schaller logged up nearly 460 hours of observation. Then in 1967, Diane Fossey started an eventful 19 years of work. At first, she was at Kabara in Zaire, and later she set up a research station in the Parc de Volcan in Rwanda, in the saddle area between volcanoes Karasimbi and Visoki. Putting these words together, to create the name Karasoki for her camp. Diane was the first scientist to be totally accepted by the gorillas. Every morning when starting out for work, I really didn't know what the day's observations would bring. The gorilla only had known humans in the form of poachers or herdsmen. Therefore, it was easy to understand their initial fear and apprehension when I first sought to make contacts with them. These days were a bit frustrating. Finally, I was rewarded by a different type of response. Termed response behavior, it was meant to intimidate with chest beats and vocalization. Slowly, over the years, all the animals of group four were approaching very closely simply because of their own initiative and the sense of curiosity. To have finally been accepted by the wild gorillas was its own reward, and the thrill of each day's contact is one that will never diminish. It was a young male gorilla she called Peanuts, who one day had enough confidence to reach out and touch her outstretched hand. An incredible moment. The first ever peaceable contact with a wild gorilla and an experience Diane never forgot. At Karasoki, she had to come to terms with solitude in rugged surroundings, sharing the trees and meadows with the animals that freely wandered around her camp. The forest and mountains, which seemed so magical to her in the beginning, later on became a source of exhaustion and discomfort. Ill health plagued her for the last few years of her work, and days, weeks, even months passed by without any visits to the gorillas that she loved. Just behind her cabin, she made a graveyard for the gorillas that either died of natural causes or were killed by poachers. As she came to know the gorillas, she named them all individually. Over Christmas 1985, Diane herself suffered a violent death. Her body was laid to rest alongside those of Muwelu and Digit. Following Diane's death, the Rwandese men who worked with her did not give up. They continued all the hard work of tracking the guerrillas, manning the anti-poaching patrols and running the camp. Without them, neither guerrillas nor park would exist. In the meantime, scientists come and go, each one furthering our knowledge of the guerrillas and the ecology of the park. At the time this film was made, a study on guerrilla family groups and the role of females was being carried out by zoologist Pascal Sicot. This is one of my study group. It is unusually large. It contains 25 individuals. In this group, um, you have two silverbacks. Um, you have also several females with their offsprings. And these offsprings are going to stay in the group until they reach sexual maturity, after which they're expected to leave. Leaving the group could perhaps be nature's way of mixing individuals and helps to prevent inbreeding. But until they do leave, the young males and females enjoy a mainly peaceful existence. 
with very close, often tender relationships with their parents and other members of the group, spending their time during rest periods in play and grooming each other. At first, departing males will simply wander for a while. Then gradually, they will try to form their own groups by taking females from established ones. And if a female already has a young infant, it would normally be killed by the new male before he mates with her. This may seem savage, but it is the male's way of guaranteeing the continuation of his own bloodline. A male becomes a silverback when he's about 14 years old. He develops a saddle of silvery white fur and a tall crest. At this time, he's a very impressive animal, about six feet tall, much larger than any of the mature females, and he weighs about 400 pounds. Gorillas feed on more than 50 kinds of plants. They usually go for the leaves, shoots and stems, often stripping off the outer layer to reach the pith. But they also eat fruits, bark, roots and even dirt, sometimes combining some of these together to make a sort of mixed salad. Goose grass, nettles, thistle. To a human, many of their food items are bitter or astringent. They also occasionally eat their own dung, which not only makes a warm meal on a cold day, but is a valuable form of recycling. And one further source of food is devoured with gusto. Though gorillas have been known to look for grubs and snails, only rarely have they been seen eating ants. Safari ants bite painfully, and it's only a matter of time before some at least find their way through the thick fur to the skin. Then it's all a gorilla can do to grab a handful of the delicacy and run. The gorillas range throughout the volcanoes. And it is part of the research at Karasoki to make daily checks on the whereabouts and welfare of three of the groups. One of these, of which Peanuts is the leader, is on Mount Karasimbi, at a height of almost 13,000 feet. Peanuts, who from that first magical encounter with Diane, went on to become a silverback, is with his group in the subalpine zone. Here the vegetation is completely different. Some of the plants are giant, Lobelias and Senecias, which may at lower altitudes be tiny, here grow to 10 or 12 feet high. This is a difficult place to track gorillas because they don't leave much of a trail. So unless it's known roughly where they were the day before, there may be little hope of finding them at all. An outstanding tracker for many years, Name Alphonse, accompanied by Alan Goodall, hopes to find Peanuts and his group. I don't know if you can. We've just found the night nests where they slept last night. 
So let's go and have a closer look. It may seem a strange habit, but gorillas always defecate inside their nests. I'm not sure whose nest this is, but judging by some of the hairs here, it looks as though it could be the nest of the silverback. All we've got to do now is find today's trail and follow that to where they are. To Gendi. Normally, from the night nests, there's a trail of broken plant material and fresh dung leading to the gorillas. But if they don't want to be seen, they can blend silently into the vegetation. Although we're just south of the equator, it can be quite cold up here because we're at an altitude of about 4,000 meters. It's a popular misconception that the gorillas have been forced up into these higher altitudes by human pressure from down below. But actually, they've evolved up here in these mountains and are very well adapted. Their coats, their hairs are much thicker than those of lowland gorillas. They come up here to feed on the giant Senecio vegetation and the giant Lobelias. Normally, they only spend a few days up here feeding on this vegetation. What's so unusual about this group is that they've been up here for over a month. The reason peanuts had stayed up high for so long indicated something was seriously wrong. It was probably because he was ill and did not have the energy to move his group back down the mountain again. Although the star of that first memorable contact with Diane Fossey, he has spent a life marked by illness or infection, which began with a terrible injury to the eye and face received in a fight in 1971, when he was only 10 years old. Peanuts has an unusual group with only seven animals in it, and six of those are males with one female who will not reach sexual maturity for another two years. For some reason, Peanuts was never very successful in either attracting females or keeping them. And so far as is known, he has no offspring. Normally, gorilla groups move frequently enough to avoid serious impact on any one patch of vegetation. But with peanuts more or less static, the giant Cynesias are beginning to show signs of wear. These plants are very old and regenerate slowly, but it is the odd behavior of peanuts that is causing his group to restrict themselves to this one small area. Although all the gorilla groups range through different zones, 
some show a preference for certain food plants. Two of the regularly contacted groups spend much of their time near the border of the park and have been known to wander outside its boundaries. Managing the conservation area includes an important plan to build a fence to keep animals in and people out. It is a huge, ambitious undertaking and one which will only succeed through the dedication of the Rwandan conservator, Kinesis Sharambere, and of the Mountain Gorilla Project, headed by Craig Shawnee. The fence prevents gorillas and other animals, such as buffalo, from damaging crops. And it also deters people from entering the park to cut firewood or to poach antelope. Rwanda is densely populated, so there is great pressure on the land, particularly here near the volcanoes, where the soil is so rich. Many of these local people may never see the gorillas that live on their doorsteps, and it's difficult to know how to convince them that they should not use the park's land to grow the crops they need to feed their families. How can they understand? why the gorillas should have so much land when they have so little. And explanations are not made easier by the presence of the foreign-owned pyrethrum plantation that took four-tenths of parkland for the production of insecticides. Yet in spite of all that, many Rwandese do believe in their park and have on occasion responded generously in their support of its conservation. And the policy of the government is to conserve all the national parks. Craig Sholley believes very strongly in supporting the needs of the people and striking a balance between them and conservation. But there is no room for error with a tiny population of mountain gorillas living in such close proximity to people. It is a conservation question that is becoming all too familiar throughout the world. The future of the natural land and all the animals and plants that live there teeters on a knife edge. It is totally in our hands. This particular part of the forest is an interesting place. Four years ago, there were cattle grazing here. It was part of a cattle project used by the Rwandan government. A year before that, there were gorillas ranging here. Realizing the importance of the forest to the gorillas, we convinced the local community to donate the land back to the park. Now gorillas are ranging in this area again. 55 hectares have been reclaimed. Such positive conservation steps offer a glimmer of hope for the remaining 400 or so mountain gorillas. The bamboo that was cut will regenerate. More bamboo, more bamboo shoots. For some groups, a favorite food. The gorillas are remarkably consistent in their taste. Most of the diet consists of foliage of herbs, vines and shrubs, which are available all the year round. Of all the important food plants, only bamboo shoots are seasonal. But when they are available, the gorillas gorge themselves. An adult female will eat about 40 pounds in a day. But an adult silverback, twice the size, will put away an incredible 75 pounds of food. It
It is no wonder that gorillas have pot bellies and occasional digestive problems. Mm. Feeding is broken by frequent rest periods, which may be prolonged when the usual mist is broken by either sunshine or rainstorms. This is a good time for socializing. Today we're on the slopes of Mount Karasimbi. This is the range of the Suza group. As far as we know, it's the largest group of mountain gorillas in the world. Yesterday there were 29, today there are 30. In all the years that people have been studying mountain gorillas, no one has ever fully observed a birth. So it's a very rare privilege indeed to see a baby so young maybe only two or three hours old. The umbilical cord is still attached and the fur is not yet dry. The birth of this new baby came as quite a surprise to me this morning. In addition to this female, there are several other females in the group that may be potentially pregnant. Also, there are two large adult silverbacks, both of whom share leadership responsibilities. But in the future, there may be a dilemma. Because of that, the group may split. We sit back and wait and watch the dynamics of the group and wonder what will happen. The tenderness between mother and newborn infant is obvious. It is not her first baby. She is experienced and quite high ranking in the group. That will increase the new infant's chances of survival. At least a third of all babies die within the first few months of their lives because of weakness or disease. A first time mother can lose her baby by not being able to produce enough milk. Happily, though, there is no such problem for this one. The silverback will protect infants and females from obvious sources of danger. But the mother has to be protected too. New infants attract a lot of attention from the other gorillas. And if she is not careful, the baby can be injured or killed through rough handling by curious or playful members of the group. They may only want to touch the baby, but even that is just not allowed. An adolescent wanting to play can be very persistent and may not realize his own strength. But an experienced mother can fend off such potentially dangerous encounters.
Observations by researchers suggest that most new mountain gorilla babies are males, but it is extremely difficult to be sure when working in the field. An imbalance in proportion of males to females might indicate inbreeding problems. This is to be expected in such a small population and made worse by the social organization of gorillas, for the majority of infants are fathered by a small number of adult males. Inbreeding could, in the long term, cause problems, perhaps irreversible ones, and it is difficult to see a solution. In a world already loaded against them, visits to the bamboo zone near the park border can be extremely hazardous. It is here that poachers set their traps, using springy stems to power snares, which they set primarily for two kinds of antelope, bushbuck and diker. To help the gorillas, experienced anti-poaching teams run daily patrols through the forest. Rwandese and Mountain Gorilla Project personnel have been doing this dangerous work for many years and have amazing ability to spot snares, often set in lines along animal trails. Until 1984, gorillas were killed by poachers to service a macabre tourist trade in gorilla parts, hands for ashtrays and heads as souvenirs. But even though that has been stopped, the gorillas still suffer. In 1988 alone, patrols found and cut 2,600 antelope traps. Gorillas have been removed from snares, treated, and some survive. But a snare inflicts a terrible wound. It can cost a gorilla a hand and death may follow if gangrene takes hold. This scene was recorded on amateur video by Craig Shawnee and shows gorillas from the Sousa group playing with a snare, which fortunately has been triggered without doing any harm. This male was lucky. A snare cost him his hand but he manages quite well using the remaining one. Suzanne Abelgard, a qualified vet, checks on the gorilla's general welfare. I monitor seven groups of habituated gorillas and I try and visit each group about once every two weeks. Sometimes working here can be hard, climbing up and down volcanoes, getting home, soaking wet, cold, hungry. But I have to admit that um, it's all worthwhile in the end. The work is rewarding, but inevitably there are depressing days when tragedy strikes. Imbele, a young female, has had her first baby and lost it. It was just four days old. It is a sad day when a gorilla dies. When a mother loses a baby, 
It is quite normal for her to continue carrying the body as if it was still alive for two, even three days after death. Craig and Suzanne stay with her in the hope that they can collect the body for an autopsy if she drops it. As time passes, Imbeli puts down the body of her baby more and more frequently. To reassure her, Craig imitates the calming sounds gorillas use when amongst each other. She seems to be feeding now, so maybe we should just stay back a bit and not push her too much. I would agree, absolutely. Yeah. We should probably stick by her for a while, though, and see if we can recover the body. Okay. So I can do an examination back at the lab and try and find out why it died. The autopsy reveals severe injury and internal bleeding as a cause of death. Imbeli was possibly too submissive to protect her baby from the eager attentions of the other gorillas, and it seems likely that the baby died as a result of boisterous play. In heavy rainfall, which is frequent, the gorillas stop feeding. The adults sit motionless, but for the infants, there is time to play. As the afternoon draws on and the rain abates, the gorillas build their nests for the night. And as dusk falls outside the park, local villagers gather in a square to see a film about gorillas, part of the conservation education program organized by the Mountain Gorilla Project and the US Peace Corps. It is a popular and regular event designed to arouse interest in the park and its animals and to keep the people up to date with any news. The film showings have been very successful in promoting conservation and there has been a steady increase in the number of Rwandis who believe there is a benefit in keeping the park. Dawn over Mikano. At the edge of the park, a group of six tourists assembles. Yeah, we just have some simple instructions for you for uh, simple behavior in the forest and also behavioral things with the gorillas. 
right here is the limit of the, the, the park and the forest. Um, once we go into the forest, we ask you to talk softly. Uh, obviously, the quieter we are, the better chances there are of seeing other wildlife, such as diker, bushbuck, buffalo, maybe some golden monkeys, and a wide variety of bird life. Okay, once we get to the gorillas, we want to stay again in a tight group, staying behind the guides and or myself, mm -hmm. okay? And we really want to keep a distance, a minimal distance of five meters between the gorillas and ourselves. This is our biggest defense mechanism against disease transmission to the gorillas. The gorillas are closely enough related to us that, uh, that they're very susceptible to human diseases, but yet they are not at all resistant. In addition, at five meters, we are not imposing upon the gorillas. So it allows you a better chance to see their natural behavior. The tourists spend only one hour with the gorillas, but there's rarely any disappointment. This group has 13 animals, one adult male silverback, five adult females, five juveniles, and two young infants. The tourists are helping the gorillas. By paying for their brief visit, they are bringing money to the park. Little do the gorillas know that by tolerating the visitors, they are safeguarding their future, for they are now a valuable asset to Rwanda. The hour expires, the tourists depart, and the forest belongs to the gorillas once more. The unanswerable question is, how far can conservation management be taken? The future of the mountain gorillas is already an uncertainty. But to what extent should we interfere with the population of wild animals in order to save them? Every step can and does raise new problems. Do frequent visits by people upset natural behavior patterns? How great is the risk from human transmitted diseases? Should the vet intervene to help weak or sickly animals? Do we know enough to do what we are doing? The philosophical discussions could continue for a long time, but time is a luxury we cannot afford. For now, every management strategy is considered most carefully, and research continues to further knowledge not only of the gorillas, but of the park as a whole. Andrew Plumtree is a research biologist based at Karasoki. His project is to study five of the herbivores in the park. He monitors their impact on food plants to find out how much competition there is, especially with the gorillas. Another study is looking at the rare golden monkeys, which are only known from the Virunga Mountains and a few other forests nearby. Shame Parkhill has spent months trying to get close enough to them to find out about their feeding habits. The golden monkeys eat, among other things, bamboo shoots, just as the gorillas do. Mikeno the oldest Virunga volcano, now extinct. Two other volcanoes are still active, though, and there are signs to suggest that volcanic activity in the whole region is increasing, a further threat to the gorillas.
This is a new cone named Kimanura on the flanks of active near Mulagira in adjacent Zaire. It erupted in May 1989, and the previous major eruption in the area was only two years before. No gorillas live here. In fact, the new eruptions are separated from the park by a narrow strip of cultivation and settlements. An eruption inside gorilla territory could, in the short term, devastate their population. In the long term, the eruptions on near Mulagira and nearby near Agongo would theoretically increase the natural area. But for now, the park exists as an island in an ocean of human settlement. In many parts of Africa, and indeed the world, the story is a familiar one, dwindling animal populations in natural areas that become smaller year by year. The pressures are obvious. The options for local people are to starve now if they do not exploit the conservation area, or to starve in a few years' time if they do. Happily, Rwanda is not yet in such dire straits, although the population, already the densest in Africa, is still increasing fast. With 95% of the people living by agriculture, immense demands are placed on land, and this problem can only increase as time goes on. Somehow we must find a solution to the benefit of all, a balance between humans and wildlife. Part of the appeal and presence of these gorillas is the fact that they are so close to us. To spend time with them is an experience that can never be forgotten. Peanuts was the first wild gorilla ever voluntarily to reach out and touch a human hand. While this film was being made, Peanuts continued to be sick. And after getting progressively weaker, he finally stopped eating. On the 1st of May, after several days of not moving from his night nest, he died. <laughs> 